Hey folks, welcome to Spooky Appalachia. I'm your host, Jimmy. And I'm your co-host, Jerry, with Jerry King TV. How are we doing today, Jerry? Doing really good, man. Just really looking forward to jumping into this story. Oh yeah, it's a long one, but it's a good one. Oh, it definitely is. I've heard it a couple times from Steve, our good friend Steve Alligator Horse is his YouTube uh, channel name. Yeah, big shout out to him. Mighty good feller. He's got a ton of good stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Steve, he's been around the block. He's, you know, he's one of them. He's a jack of all trades and everything. You know, he's just got a lot of experience with a lot of different things under his belt. And, and he's got a lot of good stories. And he's a very credible guy, too. Oh, yeah. I, I would say. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, Steve, he tells you something. That's when... He's one of them fellers. If he tells you something, you can take it to the bank. Mm hmm Well, Jared, do you want to get into this story? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right, folks. This one is called My Booger Encounter, 1978. My first encounter, which at the time, I didn't think about it involving a Sasquatch, was just a frightening experience that I had no explanation for. It happened one weekend in 1978. While camping with my horse on the north end of Brookville Reservoir property, it began with me deciding to take a weekend camping trip on horseback. I had time on my hands, no money, so it seemed like a good way to you know, spend my days off. I only worked four nights a week, Monday through Thursday. So Friday morning, I packed light camping gear on my saddle, a blanket, ground cloth, canvas bucket, some rope, nose bag for my horse and some oats, a pair of hobbles, and an old 1892 Winchester carbine and carried a scabbard. Had a 1744 caliber cartridges in my carbine, I also had a tin cup, canteen, my food, which consisted of coffee, a can of crazy cheese, and some crackers. It was warm, so I only packed a light denim jacket, changed the socks, and buckskin moccasins that I wore while sleeping. I rode about 17 miles that Friday, and toward late afternoon, I began to get into the Brooksville Reservoir property, specifically east fork of the Whitewater River began to feed the lake. I left the gravel road that I'd been riding down and moved my horse along an old abandoned uh, roadbed along the river that was no longer accessible to cars or trucks. It was just a shadow of its former road and eventually even that road dwindled away to nothing more than a footpath. I rolled into Wood River Bottom and looked for a place to camp. I was having a good time. I made camp by tying a picket rope between two trees for my mare, then spread out my ground cloth, gathered wood for a fire. Didn't bring no flashlight, so small campfire for coffee and have a little bit of seeing light to do until I turned in, you know. That was all that was necessary. While I made camp, I hobbled my horse and turned her loose. That way she could graze on some tender, sweet spring grass. I will mention here for the, those who don't know, hobbles are leather straps with a short chain attached to two leather ends. They are hobbled around the horse's front feet to allow them to, you know, move freely but stops them from running off. And picture somebody trying to move with their shoelaces tied together. <laughs> Them's horse hobbles. Anyway, while she grazed, I made a cup of instant coffee, had some crackers and cheese. I then took a paperback book from my saddlebags and laid back with my head on my saddle and read while enjoying a cigarette. Then the night, the light began to fade. I went and called up to my mare, and after removing her hobbles, I led her down to the river on a lead rope to get a drink. 
And this is where the weirdness began. As she was drinking, she suddenly lifted her head from the water and with her ears held forward, which indicated something had her attention. She looked intently upriver. I naturally followed the line of her interest, strained my eyes in the night, trying to attempt to see what caught her attention. She was so tense that she hadn't even swallowed a drink of water. She was holding it in her mouth. Sounds of the water was dripping off her mouth back into the river. It was the only sound I heard. Her demeanor had changed as she was now acting spooked. On the way back to camp, she kept stopping and would stare in the gathering darkness in the woods. Staring north as she did out the river, I put her hobbles back on her and tied her to the picket rope between two trees by neck rope and around her neck behind her head and fed down through the halter ring under her chin. Well, this type of tying keeps a horse from hurting itself if they spook while tied. It was also, it saves on broken halters. Well, all the while I was sitting there, sit, getting her situated for the night, she kept acting jumpy and move around nervously. Then we'll just freeze suddenly motionless and start up river. Only her nostrils was moving in an attempt to catch some kind of odor. Well, here I'll give a little background on my horse. She's well-trained, you know, well-trained mount. That was used for working livestock. She was unflappable around traffic, could be safely ridden along the road, including the highways. I also used her on my trap line. She weren't spooked by gunfire neither, or the you know, smell of blood. I owned her until her death, up into her upper twenties. And except for this night camping, she had only been spooked one other time, and that was the first time she heard a wild turkey gobble. What I'm saying is, she was a good, solid mount that I could trust in any situation. Later, I was married later. She'd go on to teach my wife eventually, both my sons, how to ride. Later, I was sure she was secure. I told her to settle down. And taking a collapsible canvas bucket, I went down to the river to bring her back uh, water for the night. By now, there was just the late stages of twilight left. I could see the water in the far bank. No details of anything. While I was filling the bucket, I suddenly caught the sound of voices coming from upriver. My first thought was great. I got a bunch of party types nearby. I assumed that thought this was, you know, my horse that was here. Now, as I said, it sounded like two or three people were talking. But nothing, you know. They were saying was distinguishable. As much of it as reached my ears sounded like just animal chatter. Animal chatter, for lack of a better word. Occasionally I'd stop, hear somebody let out a whoop. And a couple of times I heard loud splashes. And, you know, it's like something heavy had hit the water. I was more irritated than spooked. I only hoped that they would not wander down to my camp. As I was going back to camp, which was only about 40 feet away, my horse suddenly let out a loud whinny, and voices instantly stopped. Now that spooked me. And I assumed that I would soon have people in my camp that I had no interest in meeting. My fire was down to coals, and for some reason, I felt the need to put more wood on it. And yeah, my horse still had not settled down much. She was jittery and was stretching the rope in an attempt to get loose. This is when I took my Winchester out of the saddle scabbard and dug in my saddle bag, saddle bag for the cloth sacks that had 10 extra rounds in it. I had seven in the carbines magazine. I sat by the campfire, occasionally stoking it with wood in order to keep you know some light in the camp. Kept talking to my mare to calm her down and attempt to you know, read my book that I'd brought along, but I could only read a few paragraphs before I'd get concentrated on the lighter sounds. I no longer you know, heard the voices from upriver, but that didn't convince my horse 
that all was well. She continued to fidget and would let out uh, knickers on occasion. I eventually gave up on reading and sat down next to the fire leaned again my Winchester, which I had placed between my knees with the butt of the gun on the ground. Somewhere along 11 or 12 o'clock, sleep overtook me. I drifted off while I was sitting upright, leaning up against my carbine. Around three in the morning, I was awoke by all matters of cane breaking loose. My mare was letting out terrified wings and was struggling against the rope to break loose. I think it hadn't been for the hobbles on her front leg, she would have indeed broke free and run. I threw a prepared bundle a uh, fire bundle on the campfire, which was now down to coals, as the bundle caught sufficient light I could see. I quickly went over to the mire, tied, my, tried my best to calm her down. Took a bit of soothing positive talk, but she finally calmed down. Kept her attention toward the dark forest north of the camp. That's when I heard the whistle. Yep, a whistle. Somebody's letting out low whistles north of me and slightly east toward the river. Well, that confirmed to me somebody, was, or possibly several someones, was messing with me. I loudly announced that I knew somebody was out there, and they weren't scaring me. Well, they weren't entirely true, as knowing that somebody was close to me did rattle me a bit. But I stepped over my far and placed wood on it. Then I picked up my Winchester. Having that old carbine in my hands give me some sort of comfort. <coughs> this is when I began to hear the footsteps. Whoever was out there in the dark began to walk in a semicircle around my camp. They started at the river and started walking westward, still north of my camp. Then they swung around south and walked to a point where they turned south, turned east and walked to the river south of my camp. Now I know the sound of the forest. Now I know the sounds of the forest and creatures make around here. Squirrels can sound like buffalo traveling through when it comes to leaves. And the deer, generally, you know, not making much sound. At that time, about the only large animal besides deer in that area would have been a coyote. And this weren't no coyote. I also knew that no prey animal would spend any time in close contact with humans. And likewise with the alpha predators, which were coyotes and foxes. There was occasional bobcat, but rarely seen back then. Although today we got plenty of healthy population of bobcat here, well, this was definitely bipedal. It was slow and it was heavy. After a period of silence, the route around the camp was repeated, a slow-paced, heavy-footed semicircle until they had reached the starting point again. And this went on for a better part of an hour, which an occasional whistle, you know, once a grunt, low growl. I couldn't tell which. My horse definitely had them made, as she had twisted and turned to keep her ears turned to the sound. Only my touch kept her from blowing a gasket again. Finally, I had experienced enough, and I loudly announced that I was armed, and I would open fire if anybody was out there didn't leave me alone immediately. With that, I levered a shell into the chamber of my 67-year-old carbine and elevated the barrel so that I didn't actually hit anybody. Well, I fired a shot in the air. The sudden report of the 40. 44-40 round split the early morning darkness and echoed through that river bottom. The sound of the shot made whoever was circling my camp suddenly take off in a loud crashing run through the woods. I'm sorry it's so anticlimactic, but that was it. Nothing else made any sound near my camp for the remainder of the night. While not calm, my mare quit struggling no longer was letting out frightened whinnies. I sat by the fire and I made a cup of coffee until dawn. At first hint of light, 
I gathered my gear and saddled my horse. Oh, one more thing. The rope I had tied between the two trees, the top of my mare too, it had been pulled so tight by her, her not long struggling, that I had to cut it with my knife and leave the ends of the rope tied around the trees. Well, this ended my weekend camping. I decided I'd return home. And by the way, once we cleared the area, my mare went back to her old dependable self, as if nothing had ever happened. Never for a moment did my mind explore the possibility that I was being harassed by a Sasquatch. I mean, Sasquatch lived in the North Pacific, in the Pacific Northwest, you know, not in southeastern Indiana. When I was young, they told me stories about the wood booger back in Kentucky. Now, all these years later, I have no doubt the thing that was around my camp was indeed a Sasquatch. Over the years, I've encountered two sets of footprints, one set in the snow and one in the forest. Both sets were found in the Charles C. Dean Wilderness in the Hoosier National Forest while hiking and hunting off trail by compass and topographical map. And both sets were found miles from any existing hiking trail and further still from any road. I already sent you some photos that I took. I also found structures in the forest that were made entirely of broken tree branches. The ends of all branches was broken off into trees. The woods had darkened, but plainly evident that the branches were not cut. Whatever broke them had to have significant strength to rip them from trees. Additionally, the structures made no sense because they weren't shelters. But this all culminated in 2008, dizzy November evening. I experienced a visual contact with a Sasquatch with a witness, my son, who was home on leave from the Army. He and I were driving alongside a field that bore a river less than a mile from my farm. I looked over and into the field as I drove along, and suddenly I slammed my foot down on the brake, while at the same time, same instant, my son blurted out, What the heck is that? That was a nine to ten foot tall being striding across the field. It appeared to be all black. Had a conical head and a very long arm that swung as it walked. The stride of the creature was enormous. Because of this sight near my farm, I won't even sit outside at night on my own yard unless people's with me, and I keep a shotgun loaded with slugs by my side. I don't even like curtains to be open after dark. It makes me nervous. Hope you found this interesting. Steve. Man, oh man. Well, Steve, I can honestly say we did find it interesting. <laughs> yeah, we definitely did, man. We definitely did. Hopefully our viewers do as well. I'm sure they will. Oh, yeah. Definitely. I mean, we always, you know, anytime you got something with a, a, a wood booger or, you know, Sasquatch, big, you know, the big man himself, you know, it's interesting. It's, mm -hmm. man, everybody loves it. Yeah. I know I do. Definitely. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much for sending this in, Steve. I'm sorry I yeah, lost absolutely. it the first time you sent it, by the way. <laughs> it all worked out good. You know, you got to send it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully he's not too annoyed with me. Nah. Nah, Steve's a good old fella. Well, folks, uh, we hope you enjoyed this one. Yeah, Make sure to like, and, uh, subscribe, <clears throat> yeah. share it out, comment. Yeah, if you have any you'd like to send in, be sure to send them to SpookyAppalachia at gmail.com. Yeah, definitely. We definitely would love to have your stories on here. Absolutely. Well, y'all have a good night, evening, morning, you know, whenever you're listening. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you in the next one. God bless and have a good one.